Turn your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're grateful for the presence of each and every one, and if we do have visitors, we're certainly grateful for that. We want to always make you feel welcome. We want to invite you to come back and be with us every time you have opportunity. Tonight we meet at 5 o'clock, and Wednesday nights we meet at 7. On Wednesday nights we have classes for all ages, so please come and study the Bible with us. We're always open to your questions. It's already been announced, but tonight I'll be starting a meeting at Peters Creek. Harley will be preaching in my place here. Uh, and I want you to come to Peters Creek if you can, but I'll just tell you up front, I've told you before, you might get a rerun. That's just, I usually use stuff I've already tried and proven uh, in meetings. I don't usually use brand new material in gospel meetings, and I just want you to know that ahead of time. Don't let that stop you. Come on. But I just don't want you to understand you may get a rerun, something you've already heard me say here. Uh, in the past, but you can support those brethren, and you know they're good to support us as well when we have our meetings. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit, which you've not received, or a different gospel, which you've not accepted, you may well put up with it. Now, I'm going to use this verse to talk about the church as the bride of Christ. The church as the bride of Christ. And he mentions that in verse 2. He says, I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. There are several passages in the New Testament that identify the church as the bride of Christ. We'll expand on some of those in a moment. Uh, but I want you to think about, when you, when you think about the commitment of a marriage, because that's the metaphor that's being used. And, and when you get married to somebody, you're making a commitment. And the same thing is true when you become a child of God. When we become uh, a part of the bride, when we become a part of the body of Christ, we're making a commitment. But I think a lot of people just see their Christianity as just a date, just dabbling with Jesus a little bit, not serious about the commitment. Uh, we just want to see him once in a while and associate with Jesus once in a while, but we're not serious about the commitment. And so that's the reason I brought this up, because this is a great metaphor to emphasize the importance of our commitment. Some disciples are just dabblers. They want to date Jesus but they're not serious about that relationship. So let's just start off here by expanding on this ideal of the church as the bride of Christ because that is a very meaningful metaphor. And as I indicated, he already says that in verse 2. He says, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband. Paul linked them up. Paul linked up the church at Corinth with Christ. He was the one who went into Corinth. We can read about that in the 18th chapter of Acts. He went into Corinth. He preached the gospel. He baptized people. He got that congregation started. And in so doing, he was connecting them up with Jesus. They were making a commitment. But notice as he finishes that sentence, I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. The church has to be pure. We have to be chaste and pure, and so we can't dabble around with sin. We ha if we're going to be the bride of Christ, if we're going to be married to Jesus, then there's no dabbling around with sin. We need to be chaste. We need to be pure. That's morally pure. That's spiritually pure. That's doctrinally pure. We need to be pure in every possible sense of the term so that we might be pleasing to the Lord. But not only that, when you think about the church as the bride of Christ, we have a role to play. Just as husbands and wives have a role in the home. Turn for, for this, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, and we have that two lessons for the price of one situation uh, in verses 22 down to the end of the chapter. We're not going to read all those verses, just a select few of them here. But we're going to start the reading in verse 22. And once again, notice how Paul connects up the relationship of husband and wife to the relationship of Christ and the church. And he's, he's picturing again the church as the bride of Christ. And he says in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 
Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And so in this marriage relationship, Christ is the husband. And he gave himself for the church. And that's an allusion to his death on the cross. He died for us that he might sanctify and cleanse us. If you were to go on and read the next couple of verses, that he might sanctify and cleanse us. And so in that he expressed his love for us. But as his bride, we have an obligation here too. He says, wives, that's us in this metaphor. We are the bride of Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. Christ is our head. He is our husband. We are married to him. And as his uh, wife, as his bride, we are to submit to him. And so you bring out not only the idea of purity from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, but you bring out the idea of submission. And, you know, this is a great lesson that a lot of churches need to learn, by the way. And I'm not just talking about churches of Christ, but a lot of churches across the board. There are people in the religious world who see the church as a legislative body. Did you know that? In other words, the church makes laws. That's why you have these churches that meet together in their councils and their synods and they vote. And they vote on things like, are we going to accept homosexuals into our congregation? Are we going to have, uh, allow gays to be a, uh, appointed as preachers in our churches? And they vote on these things as if it was a voting issue. <laughs> Those issues are not voting issues. They were settled by the Lord. And the church is not a legislative body. The church is not a lawmaking body. The church is a submissive body. That's what Ephesians 5 is telling us. Our job is to just to obey the Lord, to obey the king and do what he says. Not only that, and carrying that idea of just a step further, we have to be righteous for our husband. Turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, we pick up on that bride uh, imagery once again. And we'll start the reading this time in verse 6. And John says, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. His wife is us. His wife is the church. We are the bride of Christ. And he says, the marriage has come, and, and this is the, uh, what we call the reception, by the way. The marriage has already taken place. Now it's time for the reception, see? And so his, his wife has made herself ready. And to her, his wife, the church, that's us, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. You see? So not only are we to be chaste and pure, not only are we to be obedient, but we are to be engaged in positive righteous acts. By the way, uh, just as an illustration of that, think about the announcement we just got this morning about helping people over in East Tennessee. Righteous acts of the saints. That's something that we have an obligation to do if we're able to. You know, as we have opportunity, as we have ability, we need to do things like that as much as we can because those are the righteous acts of the saints. Let's read on. He says in verse 9, then he said, right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's why I said this was the reception. The marriage has taken place. This is the reception, you see. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And then taking that metaphor just a step further. Not only are we to be chaste, not only are we to be submissive, not only are we to engage in the righteous acts, but we are to be faithful in the sense of not committing any kind of adultery. Turn over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and James picks up on this metaphor yet again. And he talks about problems among brethren. Uh, first four verses here, I'm getting down to verse 4, but the first four verses, he says, verse 1, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Now among you, he's talking about in a congregation. Where do wars and fights come from? You're not getting along. What's the problem here? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You're trying to get it car by carnal means instead of just asking God. You ask, you go ahead and ask God, you moved on from that. You ask God, but you don't receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Look at that last line, that you may spend it on your pleasures. The church doesn't exist to live for our own pleasure. 
We exist to live for the pleasure of Christ. And when we are the bride of Christ, we cannot be involved in adultery. In other words, we can't commit ourselves to someone else. Whether it's our pleasures, whether it's our lust, whether it's some particular sin, we have to be faithful. And look at the next verse. Adulterers and adulteresses. He's speaking spiritually here. He's not talking about literal adultery, although that's sinful too. He's speaking spiritually, spiritual adulterers, spiritual adulteresses. We're not faithful to Christ. We're not faithful to our husband, you see. He says, do you not know that friendship with the world, that's the way that we're being unfaithful. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. You've got to pick a side. You've got to pick a team, with God or with the world. Whoever, therefore, wants to make himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And I went through all of that just to show you how broad that metaphor is in the Bible, how meaningful it is. There's a reason God chose that imagery, because most human beings engage in a marriage relationship. Most of us, at some point in our life, we find somebody and we marry them, and we understand the commitment involved in that. It's not just a date. We're not dating anymore. There was a time when Anna and I were dating, but we're not dating anymore. We made the commitment. We said, I do. And we made a commitment, you see. And the same thing is true when you become a Christian. You first meet Jesus and you learn about Jesus, but at some point you make a commitment. And when you make a commitment to Christ, you become a Christian. Now you, you're in a marriage type of relationship and it demands purity and faithfulness and obedience and not getting sidetracked with the things of this world. Now, let's think about our sermon title. Are you just dating Jesus? You know, sadly, there's a lot of religious people who just want casual dates with Jesus. They're not serious about their commitment at all. I'll see Jesus every once in a while. Have you ever come across people like that? They won't come near a church building except maybe at Christmas time. Or maybe Easter time. And of course those we realize as members of the body, we realize those are man-made holidays in the first place. They're not bound upon us by scripture. Uh, but nevertheless, well, I'll go at Christmas time. I'll go at Easter time. Or maybe if I'm going through hard times. I can't tell you the number of situations as a preacher over the years. People have a hard time. Somebody gets very, very sick in the family. Preacher, come. Preacher, see us. Preacher, pray for us. And, and, and then everything comes out. And you never see them again. They only want you. They only want anything to do with you, or more importantly, to our point, with Jesus. They only want anything to do with Jesus when they come upon hard times. There's no commitment here. It's just a casual date, you see. And, you know, they think about, well, Jesus has got a decent family. I'm talking about the rest of the church, you know. He's got a decent family, and they're very nice people, and they're okay to be with, but not too often. I mean, how those church people can be awfully stifling. And so we just want to kind of dabble with religion. We dabble with Jesus. We're not really committed. We're not married to him, but we're just dating him once in a while. Holidays, hard times, uh, every once in a while we just uh, make a commitment to Jesus. And then while they're doing this, you know what a lot of people do when they date? They don't usually date exclusively because you're not married, you see. And so you'll date Jesus, but you might also date denominationalism. You ever know anybody do that? Say, well, I'll date Jesus. I'll come and see Jesus and his people once in a while, but I'll also go here and see the Baptists, and I'll also go here and see the Methodists, and, and you're dating around. And I'll date around with evolutionism, and I'll date around with secularism, and just kind of dabble and see this one and see that one and try to have a relationship with all of it. You see, there's no seriousness here. There's no commitment here. They date Jesus occasionally, but they're just not committed. And the point I'm trying to make is that's not good enough. That's not going to get you to heaven. That's not going to get you into a relationship with God. That's not going to get you what you really want out of this life. What you really want is to go and be with God in heaven, isn't it? Surely that's what you want. And, and if you want that, you're going to have to treat Jesus as a little bit more than just a casual date. Turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. And in, in these particular verses, verses 17 to 20, I'm not going to read all of those, but in verses 17 to 20, Jesus is kind of getting at the heart and the purpose of his sermon here. Uh, in fact, no, I said I wasn't going to read the whole thing, but I think I will. Verse 17, don't think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. He's referring, when he says law and the prophets, he's talking about the Old Testament. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy them. The word destroy there means to obliterate. And of course, Jesus was right. 
The proof of that is that the law and the prophets are still in your Bible, isn't it? To this day, the law and the prophets are still in your Bible. He hadn't destroyed them. They're still there. I didn't come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. I came to give them their full meaning. I fulfilled the prophecies. I fulfilled the types. I fulfilled the law perfectly. I kept the law perfectly. This is the way Jesus fulfilled the law. And so when you fulfill a contract, so to speak, then the contract may still exist, but it's no bind, not binding anymore. And he goes on to say, verse 18, Assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And so that's how important the law of Moses was. And he says in verse 19, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments. Keep in mind, he's talking about the law of Moses. Jesus lived under the law, died under the law, and was teaching people who were under the law. And so he speaks of those commandments. He's talking about the law of Moses. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great. Let me just, for the purposes of this sermon, in other words, take it serious. Take it serious. And then let's look how he finishes this paragraph in verse 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you need to be a little bit more serious than the scribes and the Pharisees. And consider who they were. The scribes and the Pharisees were religious people, weren't they? Religious people highly thought of in their world, in their Jewish world. But they weren't serious. They had their little traditions and they had their little loopholes to get around what God said. And, and so even though they were religious and they tried and they pretended and they casually dated Moses, they weren't serious about their commitment at all. And Jesus said, you're going to have to be more serious than they are. You're going to have to be more serious about Jesus than they were about Moses. If your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, it's got to be more than a show. It's got to be more than put on. And if your righteousness doesn't do better than that, he says, you're not going to heaven. It's just not going to happen, you see. That's how important this is. Now, there are others, not so casual. They might get a little bit less casual. They'll be a little bit more serious about Jesus, okay? So let's talk about them for just a minute. They'll see Jesus a little more regularly. I might see him once a week. I might even see him twice a week, see? And so they might show up, and they're here. And, well, I love his family. I love being with his family, the church. I love being with the family. Nice people like to be with them. Sometimes they even help me out. I get in a jam, and they're there for me, and they help me out, you see. And they might even date Jesus exclusively, Sometimes when you're dating somebody, you reach a point where you become exclusive. You become a couple, a thing, as they say nowadays. You know, you start out, and you know, I'm dating this one, and I'm dating that one, and I'm dating another one here. And you're just kind of checking everything out. And then you say, well, now we're going to be exclusive, see? And, and so that's where some people, they get. They get a little bit more serious. Not serious enough, but a little bit more serious. So I won't go date the Baptist because I'm exclusive with Jesus, and I won't go date uh, other denominations, and I won't go date secularism, and I won't go date humanism, and I'll just try to focus in on Jesus, you see. But still, we're just dating. See, they've not crossed the line yet. They've not made the full commitment to marriage yet. And so that leaves them free, because I'm not married, leaves them free to do some other things. And by other things, I mean sin. Sometimes people want it that way, and they're faking it. They're faking it once again. Jesus said we've got to do better than faking it. Go to Matthew 7 now. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, verse 21. And Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, in this context, when he speaks of the kingdom of heaven, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about heaven up there, the heavenly kingdom. And he says, Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter. Just calling Jesus your Lord. And look, you've moved. You've moved from just a casual date to a little bit more serious, a little bit more exclusive. I'm going to call him my Lord. I'm not going to call Moses my Lord. I'm not going to call Muhammad my Lord. I'm not going to call anything else. My, Jesus is going to be my Lord. But he says that's not enough. It's not enough just to say that. But you must do the will of the Father in heaven. That gets back to what we were saying earlier about submission, about obedience and purity and all those things. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And you know that sounds real good on the surface, doesn't it? But they're still dabbling. 
done some amazing things. We prophesied and we cast out demons and we did lots of wonderful works and it sounds real good. But Jesus, in reply to this, he says, Then I will declare to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. In other words, they're not fully committed. <coughs> Partially committed, exclusive, just exclusively dating Jesus, but not married to him. And so because they're not married to him, they're still in iniquity. You see, you can't have your sins forgiven until you actually marry Jesus. Your sins, are, your sins are still your sins. They're still with you. You're, you're seeing Jesus and you're coming and you're talking, to, talking him up and praising him, but you've not made the commitment, you see. And when you do that, you're just faking it and you're kidding yourself, you see. So a lot of people are just dating him. They're not really married to him. They've not made the commitment. That's what we're trying to get you to see here. And that brings us to our final point and really what this is all coming around to. What's the problem here? Those who are dating Jesus simply lack the true commitment necessary to be the bride of Christ. True commitment is actually shown by actually getting married. You know, there's a lot of people today who fool themselves on that, by the way. They move in together. What's the, what's the, the crude expression? They shack up. They, shack, they move in together. They move in. That's, that's not marriage. They say, well, we're committed. No, you're not. You're not committed because the reason you didn't get married is just leave you an out so you can walk away whenever you want to. So you're not willing to make that commitment. I'm not going to put a ring on it. I'll move in with it, but I'm not going to put a ring on it, you see. And you're not committed. And you know anytime you take a notion, you can walk away from that. What good is that? What, what good is that? There's no commitment here. And if you're going to be committed to Jesus, you've got to actually get married. Turn with me, turn with me if you will, to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, and he talks about the law of Moses and the gospel of Christ here. And to illustrate it, of all things, he uses marriage. Isn't that interesting? Again, that kind of goes right along with our lesson here. And in Romans 7, he says, verse 1, Do you not know, brethren? For I speak to those who know the law, he's speaking there of the law of Moses, that the law has dominion over man as long as he lives. What do you mean, Paul? Well, for instance, verse 2, the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. What law? God's law. Okay? But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So he's using marriage to illustrate our relationship to God. And he says, he goes on to say in verse 3, So then if while her husband dies she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. Why? Because that's what she is. That's why. That's exactly what she is. She, she's married to one man, now she's married somebody else. She will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law, though she's no adulteress, though she's married another man. Now, if you stop there, you might think that he's just talking about marriage. Now, he was, but not just. He was actually talking about your relationship with Christ. That's where he's headed here. Everything he says about marriage is true, but he's making an application in terms of our lesson here, he's making an application to our relationship to Christ. Now watch this, verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law, the law of Moses, through the body of Christ. What happened with his body? It was nailed to the cross. And when, he was, when he was nailed to the cross, the law of Moses died. And then read the rest of the verse. You have become dead to the law through the body of Christ that you may be married to another. Can't marry that other one until the other one's dead, see? Well, who's the other one? Even to him who was raised from the dead. Jesus. Married to Jesus. You can't keep dating him. You can't even just move in with him for a while and live together. That's not going to work. You've not made a commitment. You know you can walk away from that anytime you want to. Jesus wants a commitment. Put a ring on it. He wants a commitment. He wants you to be fully committed, you see. And there are a lot of people, that's the reason they don't get married. They say, well, I've got commitment issues. You ever heard people say that when it comes to marriage? I've got commitment issues. Some people have commitment issues with Jesus. I've got commitment issues. I want to be able to walk away from Jesus and do as I please every once in a while. I don't want to be fully committed. Well, that's not going to work. That's not going to be acceptable to God. And here's the kicker. When you commit to a marriage, and that's what we're doing here, committing to Jesus, when you commit to a marriage, and I think we, I did a lesson on this back when we first moved here about the commitment of marriage. And it's not about, listen carefully, it's not about my happiness. It's about my spouse's happiness. This is where a lot of marriages fail. 
they, they, they become self-centered. And they, well, I'm not happy. I'm not happy in my marriage. Well, what are you doing to make your spouse happy? This is what it's about. And your spouse should be doing things to make you happy. It's not about your happiness. It's about making your spouse happy. Now plug that in right here. I'm not happy with Jesus. It ain't about your happiness. It's about you making him happy. Turn, if you will, now to, to clinch this to Colossians 1. Look at this. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul, he says, verse 9, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Boy, there's a lot said there. He's talking about growing in the faith. Filled with the knowledge of his will. This, if you're going to do this, it's going to require a commitment, by the way. And then verse 10, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord. Here it comes, fully pleasing yourself. That, that's not what that says, is it? Fully pleasing yourself, that's not what it says. Fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. If more married couples would learn that, it would solve a lot of marriage problems. The marriage isn't about you, it's about your spouse. You married them to make them happy, and they married you to make you happy. It ain't about whether you are happy, it's about what you're doing for the other one, you see. It's about the other person, the other party. And when you marry Jesus, it's about him, it's not about you anymore. It's about being committed to him and making him happy, and being fully pleasing to him, you see. And true commitment, as we all know, anybody who's married, been married 10 minutes knows this. It means sometimes i got to say no to myself. There's things I'd rather do, but she comes first. See, that's the idea. Things I'd rather do, but she comes first. Same thing with being married to Jesus. Sometimes we have to say no to ourselves. Turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. And Jesus makes it very clear here what it's going to take, the kind of commitment it's going to take to please him. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him, number one, deny himself. You no longer matter. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to be married to Jesus, you no longer matter. Deny yourself. Say no to yourself. Self is no longer important. Deny yourself. Number two, take up his cross daily in Bible times. Take up your cross, take up your cross. What a metaphor that is. In Bible times, if you saw somebody carrying their cross, that was a dead man walking. Think about that. The Romans made you carry your own cross to the execution site. We can see a great illustration of that in Jesus himself. They made him carry his own cross to the execution site, and he fell under the weight because he'd been scourged and beaten so badly, and they had to compel somebody from the crowd to carry the cross the rest of the way to the execution site. Jesus wasn't capable of doing it anymore. He collapsed, you see. But the point I'm making is carry your cross means you better be willing to die for me. That's what that means. It doesn't mean you got a little arthritis and you're going to go to church anyway. That ain't what that means. It means that you've got to be willing to die for me. If you doubt me, just read the next verse. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Bearing your cross means I've got to be willing to die for Jesus. Are you committed? That's what a commitment requires. You've got to be willing to die for Jesus. And then he says, I'm not done. Ain't that enough? Be willing to die for you? Ain't that enough? No, he says, now follow through. Follow me. Don't just talk, but do. Look at that. Look at the commitment. And we all know, as anybody who's been married 10 minutes knows what a commitment you've made now. That spouse is number one to you outside of the Lord. That spouse is number one to you. And the same thing with Jesus. He becomes number one to you. And you need to be willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, even be willing to die, in other words, and actually then follow through. Marriage is about sacrifice. And being married to Jesus is about sacrifice. Are you willing to make the sacrifice? It also means that we've got to, to use biblical language, hate all competitors. When someone comes along and tries to pull you away from Jesus, you know when you're married, that can happen sometimes. It might be uh, someone come along and try to pull your wife away from you. Or someone cry, come along and try to pull your husband away from you. A temptress or a tempter, you see. And that happens when you're married to Jesus. There are people come along all the time try to pull you away from him. 
try to pull you away, you see. And so we've got to have an attitude, uh, to use biblical language, I hate all would-be rivals. Turn to Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 26. Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. If you write in your Bible, underline the word cannot. That's important. You, you cannot. There's no play in it this. You cannot be his disciples. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that this is a figure of speech. It's called a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to make a point. He's not telling us to literally hate our spouses and children. Not literally, because other verses tell us to do that. But the language is strong on purpose. Remember when we studied about interpreting the Bible. Figurative language paints a picture for us. And it makes it more vivid, you see. And so in comparison to the love that you have for God, your love for your spouse should appear to be hate. In other words, I love, I love my wife, but I love God so much more. So much more, you see. That's commitment. And that's the kind of commitment it's going to require. I've got to hate all would-be rivals. When someone comes along and tries to tempt me away, I've got to say no. Immediately. Don't even give it a thought. No way. I'm not. I'm committed to this person. And I'm not going to be with another person. And when it comes to Christ, I'm committed to Him. And I'm not going to be with anybody else. Bottom line here, brethren, the Lord is looking for a lifelong marriage partner. Does that describe you? He's not just looking for a date. But a lot of people are not willing to make the lifelong commitment. They just want to dabble. They just want to date Jesus, you see. They just want a good time, to put it in plain English. They just want a good time. They want what Jesus has to offer, forgiveness of sins and everlasting life and a home. And they want what Jesus has to offer, but with no strings attached. Well, I got news for you. There are strings attached. There are obligations. We make a commitment. This is the problem so many of us have. Now, here's the thing. If we're going to make a commitment as we, as we slide into the invitation, did you know, I even got a sermon on this too, there's actually a commitment ceremony to Jesus. You know, when you're married, we always have a ceremony. Uh, a lot of times it's in a place like this where you've got two aisles and you've got a preacher stand down here and the bride and groom come down. And you've got a little ceremony you go through, you see. There's a little ceremony. Well, do you know when you become married to Jesus, there's a little ceremony. It's called baptism. Turn, if you will, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. If you'd like to commit to Jesus this morning, there's a little ceremony you have to go through to do it. He says in verses 1 through 4, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? In other words, can I just dabble with Jesus? Can I just date him casually? And he says, certainly not. Absolutely not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? If you're going to go through this commitment ceremony, one thing you've got to do is die to your sin. I'm done with it. I'm not living that way any longer. Now, this, this means with, with full intent. Now, we know sometimes we stumble back into sin. That happens. But with intent. I'm intending now to make a complete change here. We die to sin. Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? That's important because that's where he shed his blood, you see. And so, in a manner of speaking, we come in contact with the benefits of his blood when we're baptized. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death the death of Jesus, baptized into his death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There's your commitment ceremony right there. When we come to Christ, believing in him, repenting of our sins, being baptized, are you willing to make that commitment? And understand when you do that, you are making a commitment. And God is going to hold you responsible to that. You've said yes. You've said I do. Where are you this morning? You ready to say I do to Jesus? I hope so. If so, we've got everything ready. We've got the baptistry ready. It's full of water. Uh, we've got garments you can change into. We've got everything ready. And the only thing we need is your commitment. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?